Ladies and gentlemen, episode 11 of In the Bushes podcast uh, here at Be Young Performance and Physical Therapy. Um, I'm joined by our strength and conditioning guy, Maddie D. Big requested episode. Uh, Matt, we got an early one here. Uh, I know you're excited about doing this. I know you've, been wanting, to, you've been wanting to tell the people what you got going on here. Um, kind of what I wanted to open this up with, and Joey, if you can pull up a picture and we just put it on the YouTube or whatever. Um, Matt and Alan Iverson are very similar. Uh, but why I say that is because they like to step over people on the basketball court. Matt, there's a picture that you actually brought to my attention of you stepping on an individual's throat in a local newspaper. Um, what happened? Where'd that come from? I mean, you're not a guy that likes to kind of be a bad sport. I mean, I feel like you're a pretty quiet, reserved individual, and then all of a sudden you're stepping on that individual's throat. Like, what are we doing, man? What's going on now? I mean, uh, it was, I was just going in on a fast break, I remember, and kid tried taking a charge, and I mean, there wasn't much to it. It just it wasn't a charge. It was fall on him, and I ended up stepping on his throat, and that was the picture they got, and that's the one they put in the paper, and yeah. All right. Well, well, now we got that out of the way. Um, can you dunk? I mean, how tall are you? Five ten. Five ten. Can you dunk? Now? Did you ever dunk? Yeah. Yeah. Probably like senior year, high school, freshman year, college. So you're a pretty explosive individual. Um, I think that's for a strength guy pretty unique. You know, being a guy that usually you see guys that are kind of, you know, I don't want to say the word meathead, but meatheads. Yeah. And yeah aren't very athletic, but they, they look the part. We actually have one here that can move pretty well, and it's a pretty good athlete. So, doesn't Matt, look the part, is that what you're trying to say? Huh? Doesn't look the part? No, I'm saying you do, you, you do look the part. Like, we have a, a, a trait that not a lot of strength guys have, and that's being explosive and not, you know, your typical guy that's, you know, dribbling with two hands. You know, I feel like that's most strength guys nowadays, you know, the fullbacks, if you will. And you're more of that wide receiver slot type. That's fair. You know what I mean? Um, is that something that you kind of, I don't know, as, as you've kind of developed in this role, um, have you kind of taken a, a liking to having that instead of that whole meathead vibe? And do you try to, to show guys, hey, look, I can do things more explosive than you. I mean, I've seen you in show and, and demonstrating. Um, you impress some of the guys in here. Yeah. So, why is that? Yeah, I, I mean, I've never been the strongest. I've never been that guy to look like I'm the biggest in the room. Um, so, I mean, I just try to to be the best. And usually I, I try to go about that, like, quietly. So, I'm not going to, you know, show that I'm the best athlete, like, just when you see me. But I'm going to... I'm gonna try and be, you know, like sneaky good where mm-hmm. I can compete, but people are like, sneaky wow. Sneaky athlete. Yeah. Okay. I mean, that's why I play baseball. I'm not the biggest guy ever. Like, you can be like all types by type for that. Um, but now I, I try to, you know, like when there's core exercises, I've tried to kind of kind of show them like, okay, it's not that hard. And then when they do, it's like, okay, maybe that was a little bit more difficult. And, you know, it kind of pushes them a little bit. Cause like, this guy just did it no problem. And, so I try to do that a little bit with them. Early beginnings for you, you know, I want you to speak on kind of where you grew up, um, the impact of being a cold weather guy, um, and are, are cold weather guys tougher? What do you think? I mean, you're an SEC guy, so you're going to say well, no, I, mean, I, grew, I grew up in D.C. Yeah, but you went to school at Ole Miss, so you're, you're going to always defend SEC. I mean. Well, no, I, I, I think what I'm asking is, like, growing up in a cold weather area, you know, I are cold weather guys tougher? I think it's. A- well, I, I mean, I was getting to that. It was just more of like, for football. If you watch college football, uh-huh. I think if you have the SEC play up north, the top teams are going to have a couple, a couple more losses here. Hot there. take there, Matt. So you think if Georgia and Alabama were to play up north, and like, let's say they play in the Big Ten. So okay, so let me let me put it. So if if Georgia and Alabama, one of them's having a good year and the other one's having an okay year, okay. you know, you expect the better team to win nine times out of ten what i'm saying is it's more of like seven times out of ten that team's gonna win because if they're playing up north where it's colder you got a lot more elements playing it's not as given that the better team's always gonna win you might go viral for that one yeah it's a hot take it's a good take i get it i get it i i get it but it's hard for me to imagine georgia 
losing to. Is it? Yeah. Is it hard to imagine Ohio State having a one-score game against Northwestern last year? I mean, when they're playing. Yeah, is Ohio State really that good though? Yeah. Compared to Georgia. Okay, but I was saying like Ohio State Northwestern. Yeah, what do you? You'd expect Ohio State to run away with that, right? Not it to finish as a one-score game. Yeah, but I think that's more Ohio State than it is comparing it to an an SEC team. But I mean, it's it's one of the top teams. They made the playoffs. Yeah. Or they were. Yeah, they still made the playoffs. Okay, so here's reverse that. Ohio State and the SEC. How are they doing? Or Michigan. I mean, I think. I don't know. I'm 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 not in that. Where are they finishing? I don't know. I really don't. I I think that they could beat some of the top teams sometimes, but they're also going to lose more games. Like, it's okay. overall you're not playing Indiana and Illinois, but you're also going to beat some teams that, wow, Alabama got a loss this year to Ohio State and Georgia. Like, it, you know, they have, like, multiple losses, not just that one. Okay. Well, hot take there. I mean, look, I, I don't – I'm not going to say that's not possible. Anything's possible. Yeah, yeah. You know, anything's possible. I, you've seen some crazy things. Um I think App State beat Michigan back in the day. Oh, yeah. Um, they beat Texas A&M. Well, Texas A&M wasn't very good, but they beat them this year, last year. So, I, I don't know. I mean, you know, I, I think a lot of people are going to have interesting opinions on that. But yeah, back to the question. So, I guess uh, you kind of answered it. Are, are cold weather guys tougher? Because yeah. you got to think, too, Ohio State's not just recruiting from the north. They're getting guys sure. from Florida, from California. Like, they're yeah. – they're in, they're a national brand. Michigan is too. Um, so it's not they're not growing up in the cold. No, not all of them. They're having to play more elements, I'd say. It's not as consistent with the weather. So are they tough? Don't forget we're in North Carolina, so I don't know what you is this more, a cold weather state or so no? maybe in, from Indiana. I, I wouldn't say I'm tougher. I don't do well in the cold. I just it's more of a mental thing. I can I can function in the cold better than people down here where they're like I can't go outside. There's a chance of snow. What's gonna happen? Where, I mean, it's like okay. There's a chance of snow. That's nothing. Like, you you learn to function in the cold, more so than enjoy it up there. Okay. I I, I yeah I get that. So, are they tougher? As a whole, as a whole, are cold weather guys tougher? I mean, if you're comparing me, I'm not tougher than the next guy down here. It's just okay. okay well, related to baseball. Related to baseball. Like people always talk about. Like I think Vanderbilt. Recruits the North really well. Um, somebody else, Wake recruits the Northeast well. UVA, um, <clears throat> and they always talk about you know this guy was, he's from Massachusetts. He's a cold weather guy. He's tougher. Yeah, and you just learn to function in it. Like in your playing baseball is you know functioning at a high level, and you just learn to do that better outside and kind of block out the fact that man we're playing in a 40 degree weather right now. It's a little flurry. Like you just you know, if you're from where I'm, I, I grew up right by Chicago up there, right on Lake Michigan, there's always like a 20 mile an hour wind or at least. And so, I mean, I had a game where I had wind burn on my face because it was so cold and just windy. So I didn't think about it then if I'm from down here and I was playing in that cold, I'd probably be like, this is miserable. I can't. So it's just more of that mentality. Okay. So sounds like you're tougher, Matt. Yeah. I, I would, sounds like Matt is tougher. I wouldn't say I'm tougher because. I had wind burn on my face. No, I mean, like, it's just I played in it. Like, yeah. once I got in competition mode, I was like that. But am I tougher than the next guy? No chance. I, I don't mean tougher in, like, who's going to win the fight. I, I mean it more like more of a mental toughness type thing. Yeah, I mean, for weather elements like that, yes. For other elements, I mean, who knows? I'm, I, I don't know how to answer that because, I mean, I'm not going to say yes, they are or no, they're not. Like, okay. I don't know. Case by case. Okay, that's fair. I'll, I'll allow that, I guess. Um, how did you end up at, at Shawnee State? And I know, how far away from home was that for you? Five and a half, six hours. Yeah. How did you end up there? Uh, what made you want to continue playing baseball? It's obviously one of those things where you had a lot of directions you could have gone, you know, when it comes to what you do. Is there a reason you chose Shawnee State from a strength and conditioning as well? Or is that just kind of, I wanted to go play baseball and that's where... I ended up kind of thing. More so the latter one there. Um, I knew I wanted to play baseball. Not like it was a lo- like super long time ago, but recruiting then wasn't what it is now where you can just get a video on your phone. Mm-hmm. I mean, I don't think they really had many 
many videos on phones at all back then. If it was, it wasn't great. So, you know, I wasn't like getting offers a bunch of places. I was having to go to camps and that. And um, I mean, I just the recruiting process for me wasn't like a big thing. Like I don't know, just baseball up north isn't as widely spread as it is down here. And yeah. Um, so it was one of the schools that that had, I guess, I had caught their interest and. Um, so for my dad, it was more of like, hey, this area we grew up in isn't the best. I want you to go away, learn to mature. And I kind of did that because, you know, being right by the south side of Chicago, Gary, Indiana, if you know that, like, yeah, yeah. you're not growing up in the best area. It's not a place that you necessarily want to stay your whole life. So mm-hmm. it was more of, hey, find somewhere away to go to school, learn to mature. And that was just the one that happened to be. Where is Shawnee State? Exactly. Southern Ohio. Southern Ohio. You grew up a uh, fan of any school up there? Like Notre Dame. Notre Dame, that's right. Notre Dame fan. Like, what, what were some good memories you had playing at Shawnee State? Um, you know, I, I, I've heard a lot of those, you know, those schools, you kind of get close with your teammates. Um, is there anything that you remember that sticks out, like any good stories that you have? You know, it was an NAI school, so we, we kind of practiced as much as our coaches wanted. and. There's no regulation. There was no regulation, and I think that's kind of why I enjoy what I do now because I understand it more. So I would say 90% of us at some point during the season, during the off season, were burnt out, overtrained. Um, you know, so getting back to that, I was around baseball guys all the time. We had individual practice, we had team practice, we had weightlifting. So when I was done with that, I kind of took the time to find other friends and you know just get away from baseball for a little bit mm-hmm. so it's not like I was always with those guys doing that like I mean I'm sure there's some stories can't think of it right now but yeah it was more of like I used that other time just to to do other things not always be in that one world yeah well you mentioned overtraining and that I definitely want to talk about that you know how many guys do you see that come in you know, high school, college, professional are overtrained right now, and I mean, it's a it's a real thing, right? right? And it's tough because, you know, your whole life is you want to outwork. You know, you're told you want to outwork the next guy or this, that, and the other. And sometimes people take that to heart too much, and they you really can be in an overtrained state, and where your CNS, your your nervous system just completely taxed. How is how do you identify people that are overtrained, and what do you do? Um, is it like a deload type thing, or? or What's the kind of protocol for that? I mean, I think first thing is like you just kind of you have to build that relationship with them, so you can kind of tell when something's off, when something's different, um, and it's just being honest with them. Like, hey, you know, like, are you really going to benefit from working out today? Are are you just going through the motions because you're told you like this is what you need to do, mm-hmm. or do you feel like when you do this day you're going to be stronger on the uh, the other side of it? Right. And so it's kind of just being honest with them and let them almost kind of figured out themselves too because then they kind of put in perspective like oh yeah I'm, you know maybe I am a little burnt out and mm-hmm. it's kind of you know just that uh, that like alarming first conversation of why am I doing this am I really like so you know let them realize at first before I'm just like hey you need to cut back because nobody wants to hear that when they're yeah. trying to be the best like hey we need to stop sure. so it's kind of like that that like that big conversation that's gonna kind of catch their eye a little bit what are some like symptom symptoms of overtraining what what can you know people are listening to this and you know are doing their own protocol their own uh you know strength and conditioning program and they're like i'm just not getting better and i'm not getting better i'm not you know I'm, i'm feeling terrible what are what are some things to kind of look out for i mean everybody's gonna have a plateau when you work out you know i'm sure you didn't always increase your weight couldn't do that but uh you know once you kind of start staying there and then almost taking a step back and you know you realize your sleep's not good you realize you just you're tired more often um you know somebody we just had in here last week he was he was just feeling fatigued and like he just couldn't figure out why he's like i slept good but like i'm just tired i can't really and you know we we set up a deload week with him come back this week he's doing good but uh i think it's more of just like they, they kind of come to find the answer once they kind of know what they're looking for. Mm-hmm. But for him, it was just, I'm, I'm just tired. I yeah. slept, I ate, I'm fine, I'm just tired, so. Yeah, and that's, 
you know, I think for the guys that are doing remote training here, um, that's why the velo tracker stuff that we do with the med balls and things are so important because it kind of gives us data to kind of look back and say, okay, you're either plateauing, you know, you're going down, was a regression. <clears throat> Like, hey, we need to maybe back off just because the med ball is kind of a full body movement. Um, you know, that explosive type training, is that something that you see as well? Like, is that something that we can use? Oh, yeah. I mean, explosive type movements, that's where it's, you know, full force. And it's not like it's a, a marathon where, you know, you have to wait for the whole, like, like a full workout to figure out. Like, you can tell if you have it or not when you're trying to d throw a med ball as hard as you can. Like, right. It's an easy one to tell there. And again, like you said, it's your full body. Yeah, the nerve system will yeah. tell us basically where the velo's at there. Um, you mentioned sleep too. Um, I know we're not sleep scientists here or anything like that, but just talk about the importance of sleep and you know the benefits that it has on you know obviously muscle growth, um, you know the, the brain, the recovery aspect of it, uh, hormone release, stuff like that. Yeah. So when I when I did my thesis in college, it was about overtraining. And one of my favorite articles I found, I believe it was, and don't quote me on this, but I think it was a UCLA professor, Matt or Matthew something. And yeah. he, he kind of went over the effects of, you know, when you're overtrained, when you're not getting enough sleep, what it does to the brain. Mm -hmm. um, it increases your chance for, I believe, developing like different diseases in your brain, like Alzheimer's, stuff like that. Yeah. And just the... I'd have to look back at that video, but just the effects of, you know, what it does to your body in such a short amount of time of not getting enough sleep, like it, it can have instant effects, but like, like I said, long term, you can develop Alzheimer's more easily, according to that article, at least. So, like, what um, is there? I've I've read some stuff on like kind of like sleep, uh, like catching up on sleep, um, how it's kind of like kind of you can go. Uh, like let's say you sleep two hours one night but then sleep 10 hours the next um yeah. is that kind of even it out or is it something where like you have two hours and that's that and it's there's no coming back from that kind of thing no so from what from my understanding there really is no catching up on sleep you know like you just have to make a good effort to get enough every day um because i mean there is a point too where if you sleep too much then your body's out of whack you're all all about trying to keep a you know consistent routine and you know if you miss it you can't just make that up it's not not like that so it's really important each day each night to get that sleep right um yeah nice all right so matt for you getting into strength and conditioning where was where did that passion come from was that something that you knew from a a young age you wanted to do uh what was kind of the pathway to that you know so like you had that conversation with chris i was kind of that same path where I wanted to go into physical therapy and you know I kind of thought that was gonna be the route my sister did physical therapy I wasn't really sure exactly what I wanted to do mm -hmm. but I saw that path from her and I kind of kind of was gonna go there from what I my training at school we weren't doing our workouts the right way for baseball and that kind of kind of sparked my interest of more of the strength and strength and conditioning route where it's like okay let's figure out how to actually get people moving better not just hey I've seen people run must run and right. you know my assistant coach was trained for a half marathon and we run five six seven miles for him and baseball is an explosive sport it's not a long endurance um, sport so you know that was doing nothing for us and then by my senior year we actually had a he played with us the year before and then he ended up being a our strength and conditioning guy he had more of an idea so we, I kind of saw the benefits of a correct like workout, like what it mm -hmm. does for you. I was more explosive. I actually was stronger too for once. Um, and so then I kind of knew I wanted to go that route. And then when physical therapy, like when I kind of realized, you know, I don't want to do this, life hits, stuff changes. I knew I wanted to do something more than just having a bachelor's degree. So mm -hmm. I found where I can get my master's. I did that online while I was working. Uh, I just wanted to to learn as much as I could about it. Yeah, I mean, when you have a master's in exercise phys, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's a pretty unique um, title that you have. What all does that entail? You know, why did you do that? Why did you want to get your master's in exercise phys? And, and how important is it kind of relating to baseball? Like, well, how do you how do you apply uh, 
exercise fizz into baseball programming for strength and conditioning? So obviously I wasn't working here when I started that degree and I didn't know that <clears throat> the ideal job like this would, would happen, honestly. Like this just was the best of both worlds. But uh, you know, I just knew I wanted something more. I didn't just want, I, I wanted to learn more. I wanted to figure out more, not just have the bachelor's degree and exercise science is such it's it's a double-edged sword it's such a such a nice thing because it's a wide variety of like jobs you can do mm -hmm. but you also have to specialize to kind of so you're not just with the with everybody else in the city trying to find that so i was like i want to do more i want to put myself you know one up than the next person and i just was curious i want to learn more about it um and then by the time <coughs> excuse me by the time I was finishing up, no. that's not gonna be in there. Why I said that? <laughs> by the time I was finishing up uh, my master's, I started working here, and you know this kind of was, like I said, the best of both worlds, where I was able to incorporate what I knew from my my schooling, all that, with baseball, the sport that I played for about twenty years. So mm -hmm. it's kind of the best of both worlds there. That's cool. Um, what's kind of when it comes to just baseball, right? You, you hear so many different things. You hear, oh, you need to be mobile. You need to be stable. You need, you can't be too strong or, you know, you need to be strong. What, what's kind of, what have you found being in here that's helped you get guys better? Is there any certain formula that you kind of come up with or do, do you guys, does one thing kind of trump the other? What, what have you found? Yeah, I wouldn't say there's a certain formula, and I'm sure you know that too. But the biggest thing that you know you see in all the successful people is they are mobile. That's kind of that that main one where you know if you're not strong, it's okay because you're mobile. You have a whippy arm. Mm -hmm. If you are strong, okay, good. You're still mobile. You can. So I think that's like the the baseline that that building first building block you kind of need to get. Yeah. Um, because from there you can go so many different options. You could be I mean, you can have strength. You don't necessarily need to be the strongest guy in the room. But once you lose that mobility, you know, I'm sure you know the injury risk goes up. Mm -hmm. Just having a whippy arm, which you can't really – you can't teach it, you know, but, like, you kind of lose that a little bit because you can't really get in the, the correct position. So you can't train patterning if you're not mobile. So that's – I would say that's that base, that base block that you kind of need. So mobility kind of trumps – a most, little bit, but I'm um, not saying like that's the only focus. Yeah. So. so you know, it's we find guys that come in here that are you know hypermobile but lack stability. Mm -hmm. um, what is kind of the protocol for that? Um, just to kind of get them stable and you know obviously that that hypermobility that they already possess. That's kind of I don't know if that's like a genetic type thing, yeah. but um, they have that. You know, what's kind of the way that we get them stable and and allow everything to not fall out of place basically i think for most of those guys 90 some percent of the time i would say they just they lack the strength too so it's kind of teaching them that you know that route where mm -hmm. they're hyper mobile and they just haven't put on strength yet so it's kind of getting them into that you know getting a little bit stronger and with that they kind of learn to you know be able to brace themselves a little more they have muscle that like they didn't didn't have before now it's like okay i can actually you know stabilize here but you know some people are just genetic freaks where they're always a little hypermobile and mm -hmm. it works for them and but yeah what about you know how do we for those guys that come in that just are, are stiff they mm -hmm. don't move well um super just there's, there's they lack mobility everywhere what's kind of the protocol for them and and how What's what's the timeline for them to, to see improvements in mobility? Because obviously that's a that's a yeah. that's a tough one, right? Because if you're not mobile, it's it's hard to kind of gain mobility. But we have found that we can you know achieve that. So mm -hmm. what do you what do you got on that? That one, a lot of time it's it's not just going to be getting in here once or twice, you know, once or twice a week. It's they need to be dedicated to that, and they need to know. Okay, this is my my low hanging fruit, I need to take this, get it the best I can. So they need to be dedicated outside of here because, you know, if they come in here twice a week, that's not enough to mm -hmm. kind of close that gap there. So they need to be dedicated. And I, I mean, I put them through a routine 
you know, kind of see where it is, is their ankles, is their hips, um, their shoulder, their T-spine. So it's kind of more of, okay, let's understand where we're the worst at. Some people, it's everywhere, and it's like, okay, we need to do this every day. Um, but it's just more of, let's figure out where it is. Are you are you serious about this? And if they are, like, uh, you, you see, we've had some guys that, you know, Chris has seen pitching, like, this is the tightest guy ever, and, you know, I've worked with them a couple times, gave them a routine, and I've talked to Chris, and he's like, they are able to get in a better position, like, and you can see the, the benefits of them, I guess, you know, taking it serious. Yeah, for sure. Um, hot, hot topic here, and this is, you're going to piss off a lot of middle school travel ball coaches and even maybe some high school coaches sprint work versus long distance um you know kind of that the old adage is uh you you want to run poles after you throw uh because it flushes out the lactic acid what do you got on that um and why don't we do long distance running in here so you know when you're throwing i don't know the the statistics on how long it takes for a pitcher to you know actually go through the wind up and pitch but it's not more than 10 seconds sure so we're training the muscles to be to move quick to move explosive and it's not going to be over a long period of time so training the muscles doing poles i think in high school i had to run for every 10 pitches run a pole or two however it was yeah and so you know you, you as a starter you throw 80 90 pitches you got 20 poles and we play down big time field. consuming. Yeah. <laughs> so that was, you know, there's the, it's flush, not lactic acid. Sure, you're getting the blood flowing. It probably feels good. And, mm-hmm. I mean, for me, my arm did feel good when I ran. But on one particular team, we played ultimate frisbee after. You're you're not constantly running, but you kind of are. But it's explosive. It's right. It's like a football game that's just constantly going. And, I mean, I, I enjoyed that. It was a way to get the, like, blood flowing but you're also sprinting because everybody's got that competitive edge. They want to win. And so it's not just standing around, not just constant running, running, running. Like it's, it's kind of with the purpose. So. Yeah. What do you, what do you got on, you know, I know a lot of guys and you know, even myself included, I felt better if I had an outing, right. I would get in and do my lift. Mm-hmm. Um, why do some guys respond well to strength training post throwing? And there's some guys that they actually like to lift beforehand too, but you know, just, speaking in a recovery standpoint what what causes guys to just feel better after a lift i think that same thing where you're just getting the blood flowing you're getting the muscles moving um you know after you throw i i do like when people do an upper body workout that on their heavier throwing day so that way you have a true recovery process for that upper half Mm -hmm. so it i think it's just helping get it moving because you know, once you're done, you sit, like, if you're a starter, you sit for the rest of the game, I'm sure you're stiff by the end of it. So this kind of gives you that, especially when they're throwing bullpens in here, where you can throw, and then you can do your workout, and you kind of, you kind of help essentially flush the system, but it just, your muscles are ready to loose, why not take advantage of that right now, and then start that recovery process yeah. in its full, rather than recover from throwing, the next day you do the upper body lift, and then you have to start that process all over again. Yeah. Type 1 versus type 2 muscle fiber, guys. Um, is there one that usually throws harder than the other? Uh, is there any difference in the weight room? Is, it a, is there a difference on how you train guys, depending on what we find during their assessments with Joey, uh, doing the toe tap test and all those things? What, what, do you, what kind of changes for you, depending on what kind of guy that they are? I mean, I can't speak specifically to what type of muscle fiber they have because obviously we're not doing that test but i mean you can see when somebody's got more you can have an idea yeah when yeah. somebody has more quick twitch muscle fibers you know typically they they move quicker they rotate faster they throw harder but it, it kind of also goes back to that mobility if you're not mobile you can move explosive but if you're stiff you're not going to have any lay back any you know proper mechanics and everything's early and it's just mm-hmm. it's like seeing somebody who's never thrown a baseball until they're 15 trying to throw and right you can be explosive but you kind of have to have that it's tough it, it yeah. is and you, you see you a couple just, guys in here that. <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's not to say like we can't train right yeah. like you can train 
being a little bit more explosive and definitely can see improvements on that. Um, and kind of how we do that is with the Proteus and mm -hmm. obviously want to speak on that. I think that's a really unique tool that we have that not a lot of other people do. Um, speak to speak on Proteus, you know, the benefits of it, how it's affected, how you program for guys and things like that. Well, first, getting back to that, we've had some guys in here. I was kind of referring to Chris Ritberger because he could be explosive, but he can't throw a baseball. I just wanted to clarify that yes, one. That's fair. Um, sorry, sorry, Rip. <laughs> Chip. Chip the Rip. But, uh, yeah, Proteus, it's a, I mean, it's a great machine. It helps, you know, we can use a, a radar gun and see how fast somebody can throw a med ball, but, you know, that's linear we can only see that one direction it's not like we can see how fast they're really rotating their trunk and mm -hmm. until we do the 3d system with joey and so outside of you know i'm sure joey doesn't want to have to mark everybody up every time to, to yeah, see sure how he fast does. they rotate yes he does he loves it <laughs> um but no the proteus it's it's like using a force plate system for the upper half for the core it helps me you know understand are they strong or do they actually move quick and you know, usually you can see, but I'll, I'm surprised sometimes when I see the test that some people are actually, they move quicker than they are powerful. And, you know, they'll walk in here, a lot of muscle mass, and you're like, okay, this guy's going to be strong. And it's like he he's 10% more acceleration than power. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, you know, like I said, it's the force plate for the upper half. It helps me understand better rather than just trying to, play it by eye and say like okay well he looks like he can use strength he looks like he can be so you actually have data to kind exactly. of go off of. yeah and that's you know obviously baseball is a pretty rotational dominant sport um so to have a tool like that in here uh it it, it does wonders for our guys and we've seen I, I would venture to say the vast majority of our guys you know go up in all their proteus numbers um, just by you know strength protocol that we put into place, so it's exciting to see, and I know the guys get excited when we do the plyo throws and all those different movements on Proteus and, and compete against each other. And I think that's also a really cool part of data that kind of goes unnoticed is you get to see the score, mm -hmm. right? So there isn't you know we're not just guessing, but you get to see it, and everybody else gets to see it too. So then it's like oh you know player A was better than me in this by a good bit, I got to catch up to him, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it drives some competition in the room, which that's what sports are, right? I think yeah. competition brings the best out of guys. So it's a, it, it, it works really well in that, in that regard as well. Um, I'd say it's also a good bridge for, obviously I know what I know, but I can't assume other people know what I know. Mm -hmm. So when I'm like, Hey, we need to work on this. It kind of helps paint that picture of, okay, now I see like my core, Right. You know, it, it does accelerate very slow or, okay, like, it is good. Now we need to clean up this. So it kind of helps paint that picture for other people as well because, mm -hmm. I mean, not everybody comes in here has trained. Not everybody knows what, you know, we know. So it it's that good, you know, gives them a picture, like yeah. a literal picture. So Yeah, it paints them something. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, I, obviously – you're you're specified in your in your field um you know none of us really understand uh strength and conditioning on the level that you do um so it's good for all of us to see that data and, and it helps you know myself chris all the other guys in here to kind of say hey this guy had this and this is why we're doing this plyo drill or you know this is why we're doing this many med balls or the stability wasn't there so we're adding water bags you know there mm -hmm. it's it's really cool data for us to get because it allows us to you know do our jobs to a, a higher degree, higher standard. Um, and I kind of want to go to the, the whole motion capture system here that we have, the 3D. Uh, I think probably the best tool in all of sports, um, you know, f to understand human body and the human movement, um, especially through Qualysis, who's been great to us throughout the years. Um, how do you, how does that change the way you program for guys as far as like mobility maybe or strength program? Uh, explosive what what kind of data do you look for and I know you read um, all of Brandon's notes and things like that uh, how does that change what you do in the weight room so you know one thing that's really hard to see is you can you can get an understanding but you can't see you know pelvic tilt like or even front legs like, it's it's kind of hard to see pel or I don't want to say pelvic tilt but the, it's hard to see the, Trendelenburg. 
Well, yeah, you, you can kind of see it when they're running, but, uh, you know, if they're front leg stable, you have an idea, but showing it on force plates really paints that picture of, wow, like, this guy really needs stability. He's falling over. His forces right. into the ground aren't great. So it kind of... It kind of lets us know, hey, we are right with this with what you, Bobby, or wow. Well, I'm you, Bobby. Yeah. <laughs> you, Chris, Brandon, what you guys all see. So it kind of, it, it reassures that and then tells us like definitively like this is what they need to work on. Yeah. It's not just guessing because it, I think it helps gives them like the athlete a better understanding too with that because, you know, I'm sure they've been places where people tell them stuff and they have no choice but to believe it because yeah. they can't see themselves thrown. So it really helps us show them and just reassures us too, like this is what's wrong. This is the exact numbers of, you know, trunk rotation. And, you know, it, I think it just helps in that regard because sometimes we just need, you know, that assurance that it's not just, well, I, th I think this is wrong. Mm -hmm. so. Was that a big adjustment for you kind of coming in here with all the data that we have or were you just – kind of like a kid in a candy store were you excited you know because uh i think just speaking from my personal experience i was pretty excited when i started you know coming in here and things is all the tools that we have you know it's it's data that you can't really deny um because at the end of the day you you like you said there are people who are just constantly guessing and mm -hmm. and you're hoping that you're doing the right things and sure you know we found a lot on 2d that we can address but in that 3d that 3d plane that that motion capture uh, just changes the game. So, does that did that excite you, or were you nervous about that? What was kind of the experience there? At first, when I kind of got those numbers, I was like, I have no idea what this is. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, Joey does a good job of breaking it down, pretty he much does. in layman's his, terms. Yes, like, his his breakdowns by far are the best uh, <laughs> when I'm reading all the notes. So, Joey, so, thank you for that. So, it could be overwhelming, but then when you kind of you know go through the weeds and see what you really need to mm -hmm. see it's like wow this is awesome let's take this and run with it now yeah. and i mean like you said it is exciting because now it's like we know what's wrong let's get like we don't have to do all that guesswork you know joey breaks it down tells me exactly what i need to know brandon does too and now it's like wow let's take this let's get this guy better and then we can compare you know the before and after we can just you know see so it, i mean it's definitely exciting um I've never seen a Proteus before. I've never been able to work with one when we got that in here. I mean, that was a game changer, too. So mm -hmm. between all that, the equipment we have here, it's definitely something to be excited about because where else do you get to work with this, get to work with experts in all these different fields? Sure. You know, it's, I mean, it's pretty awesome here. Yeah, that's, that's great to hear. And I, what I want to touch on before we get out of here is, you know, the importance of each phase for guys, mm -hmm. you know, in our, in our strength programming. Um, just kind of speak on reconditioning, the hypertrophy phase, uh, that strength phase, and then, you know, I think the most important, that power speed. Um, mm -hmm. You know, why do we do each one? And kind of just give us a little brief rundown of each as well. So the reconditioning phase, it's not, it's nothing, nothing new. It's just more of setting that base, setting, you know, getting the muscles back used to working out because whether it's after, you know, a season where you really just haven't been lifting the mm -hmm. same that you would in the off season or, you know, you took a week or two after the season. You kind of just need to get those muscles uh, retoned and ready to go. So, do you think that would be good for like a, let's say like a, a younger high school kid that's really never been in the weight room? Mm -hmm. um, how important is that reconditioning phase for them? Because they don't have any background, you yeah. know. So, what, what would you would that be a large part of, of what they're doing in here? I think it's most important for them. So that way they can not only get the muscles used to lifting weight, they can kind of get a feel for different lifts and just learn how to weight lift. So that phase for them would probably be a little bit longer because everything's new to them. They kind of need to figure it out. And of course, if they've never weight trained, they're going to be sore. So it's kind of, we're going to do this process slowly and we're just going to get the reps in so you can learn the movement, but also so that way we can get that soreness and not try to, you know, we're not trying to increase the weight when we're sore. We kind of know it's a process. So it's probably most important for them. Uh, but that's what that reconditioning phase is, just get them to learn the movement, get them back used to it. Uh, then after that, it's hypertrophy phase. And this is the point where, okay, now we've, we kind of, um, 
we've gotten back into it, let's start that muscle growth. And some people, it's just more getting back to where they were before season. Mm -hmm. I'm sure that was most of what you did. Yep. Some people, high school especially, it's you never train. Let's actually add some muscle onto you so we can recruit more muscle fibers when we're trying to, you know, get more explosive. So that's what the hypertrophy phase is mostly. Yeah. Um, after that, it's more so about – you know, now that we got a little bit of muscle mass to us, let's get those muscles moving a little bit quicker, moving that weight quickly. So it still, still has some weight to it. It's not like we're just trying to move explosive. We are, but with weight. Right. Uh, kind of get there, and then that final phase is where, you know, we're we're getting ready for the season, most likely. Mm -hmm. You know, for the people that are here for the year, we might not hit that phase quite the same. We might kind of restart that cycle and obviously we'll we'll throw some obvious to me and you but we'll throw deload weeks in there as well so it's not just right. you know months of training without a break uh, but that last phase is where you know the season's coming up whatever we need to get ready for is coming up let's cut back the weight let's get explosive let's try to move everything as quickly as we can um, you mentioned joey's uh tap test you know some people just you know we need to that's a great test for where how explosive can we be what type of you know what type of muscle fibers do we have are they going to be endurance where we can do good on that and it looks good or is it going to be explosive where you know you're giving it all you got for those first 10 seconds by the last 10 you're just gas so mm -hmm. that's a good test for that um okay so then how do you maintain in season because obviously you know you said mm -hmm. we do this the 12 month um programming here what how do we maintain in season um you know what what's the importance of maintaining strength throughout a whole entire year let's say for mm -hmm. you know you have obviously high school games are a little bit lo uh, shorter than a college season and, and you know that goes up to the pro ball as well when you're playing you know up to 162 games a season um you know what's the, what's the importance of just keeping strength throughout mm -hmm. a year i think that's tricky too because that's once you get to that point it's kind of out of our hands a little bit because then the coaches have the final say and I'm sure your your coaches all had different thoughts on it of weight training, you know, from high school all the way up to pro ball. But it's it's important to maintain it because you don't want to just you don't want to lose all of what you just gained. Like right. Then it's kind of I want to say pointless to do that, but you know, then we're good for the first what month of the season, and then come to playoffs where you need to be at your peak. You're mm -hmm. fading. You're not where you were. Your body probably feels different because you probably lost some weight actually um so it's definitely important to try to maintain it not not the same weight but just getting in the weight room keeping keeping your muscles at least conditioned because it's going to help you know prevent injury obviously if we're not going crazy but but also to rec like i said to recruit more muscle fibers if we lost all that muscle then we're just recruiting the same amount we were before we can't get as explosive we can't move as powerful right so it's it's important there but like i said it it's kind of out of our hands at that point because if the coach is like i don't want you doing it it's tough you know mm -hmm. yeah did you ever run into that um i think once you get to pro ball and then you know well in college yes like college i think it's it's really hard to do that um just because you're you're lifting as a team the mm -hmm. the weight room times are set you know you have your own strength and conditioning guy um you know but i think once it becomes more of your career, especially mm -hmm. in pro ball, I think you have a little bit more say uh, in what you're doing and how you're doing it. As long as you have an idea, right? You can't you can't go in there with some stupid uh, mindset or program and and just completely ignore common sense. I mm -hmm. think, but as long as you are educated and have somebody that you trust that's kind of doing your programming, um, you know, most strength and conditioning guys are are good with it at the pro ball level, just yeah. because you know they know that. It, at the end of the day, it is your career, and as long as you're doing something that's benefiting you, that's at the end of the day all that matters to them. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think obviously in season it's super important to maintain strength, um, just because you don't want to, like you said, I think the risk for injury is also there, uh, just because you start to lose muscle and, and you're maybe not moving as fast, and maybe you lose some mobility here and there as well. Uh, I think it's just really important to to have some sort of strength program in place. You know, obviously we do a really good job here. So uh, Matt, I really appreciate 
you coming by and doing this, man. I know it's an early morning. I know we got a lot to do today, but uh, you know, I, I appreciate it. I know Joey does as well. We've been trying to plan this for a while. So, Joey, this is for you. In the bushes. Thanks, Maddie. Appreciate you, brother. No problem.